This is tape number two on the new order of barbarians. Change. Nothing is permanent. Streets would be rerouted, renamed. Areas you had not seen in a while then would become unfamiliar. Uh, among other things, this would uh, contribute to older people feeling that it was time to move on. Uh, they couldn't even, people would feel they couldn't even keep up now with uh, the changes in areas that were once familiar. Vacant buildings would be left to stand empty and to deteriorate, and streets would be allowed to deteriorate in certain localities. The purpose of this was to provide the jungle, the depressed atmosphere for the unfit. Uh, somewhere in this same connection he mentioned, uh, buildings and, be bri and bridges uh, would be made so that they would collapse after a while. There would be uh, more accidents uh, involving uh, airplanes and railroads and automobiles. All of this to contribute to the feeling of uh, insecurity that nothing was safe. Not too long after this presentation, uh, and I think one or two even before in the area where I live, we had some uh, newly constructed bridge to break. Uh, another newly constructed bridge uh, defect discovered before it broke. And I remember of reading just scattered incidents around the country where shopping malls would fall in uh, right where they were filled with shoppers. And I remember that uh, one of the shopping malls in our area, the first building I'd ever been in where you could feel this vibration throughout the entire building when there were a lot of people in there. Uh, and I remember wondering at that time whether this uh, shopping mall was one of the buildings he was talking about. Talking to uh, construction people and architects about it, they'd say, oh no, that's good, uh, building vibrate like that, that means it's, it's flexible and not rigid. Well, <laughs> maybe so, we'll wait and see. Other areas, though, would be well maintained. Uh, not not every part of the city would be slummed. There, there would be uh, the created slums and other areas well maintained. Uh, those people able to leave the slum for better areas then would learn to better appreciate the importance of human accomplishment. Uh, this meant that uh, uh, if they left the jungle and came to civilization, so to speak, uh, they could be proud of their own accomplishments that they made it. There was no uh, related sympathy for those who were left behind in the, in the jungle of uh, drugs and uh, deteriorating uh, neighborhoods. And then a statement that was kind of surprising, we think we can effectively limit crime to the slum areas so it won't be spread uh, heavily into better areas. I should maybe point out here, uh, these are not obviously not word-for-word -word quotations after 20 years, but uh, where I say that I'm quoting, I'm giving the general drift of what was said close to word-for-word, -word, perhaps not precisely so. But anyhow, I remember of wondering, uh, how can you be so confident that uh, uh, the criminal element is going to stay where you want it to stay? But uh, he went on to say there would... Uh, would be increased security would be needed in the better areas. Uh, that would mean uh, more police, uh, better coordinated police efforts. Uh, he did not say so, but I wondered at that time about the uh, moves that were afoot to consolidate all the police uh, departments of suburbs around major cities. Uh, I think the John Birch Society was one who was saying, support your local police, don't let them be consolidated. And uh, I remember wondering if that was one of the things he had in mind about security. It was not explicitly stated. But anyhow, he went on to say there would be a whole new industry of residential security systems uh, to develop with alarms and locks and uh, alarms going into the police department so that uh, people could protect their wealth and their well-being. Uh, because some of the criminal activity would spill out of the slums into better, uh, more affluent-looking areas that looked like they'd be worth burglarizing. But, uh, and again, it was stated, uh, like as a redeeming quality, 
see, we're generating all this more crime, but look how good we are. We're also generating uh, the means for you to protect yourself against the crime. Uh, sort of repeated thing throughout this presentation was the uh, uh, recognized uh, evil and then the uh, self-forgiveness thing. Well, see, we've given you way out. American industry came under uh, discussion. It was the first that I'd heard uh, of the term global interdependence or that notion. Uh, the stated plan was that different parts of the world would be assigned different roles of industry and commerce in a unified global system. The continued preeminence of the United States and the relative independence and self-sufficiency of the United States would have to be changed. Uh, this uh, was one of the several times where he said, in order to create a new structure, you first have to tear down the old. And uh, American industry was uh, one example of that. Uh, our system would have to be curtailed in order to give other countries a chance to build their industries uh, because uh, they would otherwise they would not be able to compete against the United States. And this was especially true of our heavy industries uh, that would be cut back uh, while uh, the same industries were being developed in other countries, uh, notably Japan. And at this point there was uh, some discussion of steel and particularly automobiles. I remember saying that uh, automobiles would be uh, imported from Japan on a uh, uh, equal footing with uh, our own domestically produced automobiles, but the Japanese product would be better. Uh, things would be made so they would break and fall apart. Uh, that is in the United States. Uh, so that uh, people would tend to prefer the imported variety and this would give a bit of a boost to uh, foreign competitors. Uh, one example uh, was Japanese. In 1969, Japanese automobiles, uh, if they were sold here at all, I don't remember, but they certainly weren't very popular. But the idea was you would uh, get a little bit disgusted with your uh, Ford, uh, GM, or Chrysler product or whatever because uh, little things like uh, window handles would fall off more and plastic parts would break uh, that, had they been made of metal, would hold up. Your patriotism about buying American would soon uh, give way to practicality that if you bought uh, Japanese or German or imported, uh, that it would last longer and you'd be better off. Patriotism would go down, uh, down the drain then. There was mention elsewhere of things uh, being made to fall apart too. Uh, uh, one of the I don't remember specific items that, uh, if they were even stated, uh, other than automobiles. But I do recall having the impression, uh, sort of in my imagination, of uh, a surgeon having something fall apart in his hands in the operating room at a critical time. Uh, was he including this sort of thing in his uh, discussion? But somewhere uh, in this uh, discussion about things being made deliberately defective and unreliable, not only was to tear down patriotism, but to be just a little source of irritation to people who would use such things. Again, the idea that you not feel terribly secure, promoting the notion that uh, the world isn't uh, a terribly reliable place. The United States was to be kept strong in information, communications, high technology, education, and agriculture. Uh, the United States was seen as continuing to be sort of the, uh, the keystone of this global system, but uh, heavy industry would be transported out. One of the comments made about heavy industry was uh, we had had enough environmental damage from smokestacks and industrial waste, and some of the other people could put up with that for a while. This, again, was supposed to be a redeeming uh, quality for Americans to accept. Uh, you took away our industry, but you saved our environment. So uh, we really didn't lose anything. Uh, and along this line, there were talks. Uh, there was then discussion about uh, people losing their jobs as a result of industry and uh, 
opportunities for retraining, and particularly uh, population shifts would be brought about. This is sort of an aside, but I think I'll explore the aside before I forget it. More population shifts were brought, were to be brought about so that uh, people would be tending to move into the Sun Belt. Uh, it would be uh, sort of people without roots in their new locations. And uh, traditions are easier to change in a place where there are a lot of transplanted people as compared to trying to change condition traditions in a place where people grew up and had an extended family where they had roots. Uh, things like new medical care systems, if you pick up from uh, northeast industrial city and you transplant yourself to the uh, south, Sun Belt or southwest, um, you'll be more accepting of whatever kind of, uh, for example, controlled medical care you find there then you would accept a change in the medical care system where you had roots and the support of your family. Also in this vein, uh, it was mentioned that uh, uh, he used the uh, plural personal pronoun we. We take control first of the port cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle. The idea being that uh, this is a piece of strategy. The idea being that uh, if you control the port cities with your philosophy and your way of life, the heartland in between has to yield. Um, I can't elaborate more on that, uh, but it is interesting that if you look around the most liberal areas in the country, uh, and progressively so are the uh, seacoast cities, the heartland, uh, the Midwest, uh, does seem to have uh, maintained its conservatism. But as you take away industry and jobs and relocate people, then this is a strategy to break down conservatism. Uh, when you take away industry and people are unemployed and poor, they will accept whatever change seems to offer them survival. And their morals and their uh, commitment to things will all give way to survival. That's not my philosophy. That's the speaker's philosophy. Uh, anyhow, uh, going back to industry, uh, some heavy industry would be remain uh, just uh, enough to maintain sort of a seed bit of industrial skills, uh, which could be expanded if the plan didn't work out as it was intended, uh, so that we, uh, the country would not be devoid of assets and uh, skills. But uh, this was just sort of a contingency plan. It was uh, hoped and expected that uh, the worldwide specialization would uh, be carried on. But uh, uh, perhaps repeating myself, but one of the upshots of all of this is that uh, with this global interdependence, then national identities would uh, tend to be de-emphasized. Um, each area dependent on every other area for one or another elements in, in a, its life. Uh, we would all become citizens of the world rather than citizens of any one country. And along these lines, then, uh, we can talk about sports. Sports in the United States was to be changed uh, in part as a way of de-emphasizing nationalism. Soccer. A worldwide sport uh, was to be emphasized and pushed in the United States. And uh, this was of interest because in this area, the game of soccer was virtually unknown at that time. I had a few friends who attended an elementary school other than the one I attended where they played soccer at their school, and they were a, a real novelty. This was back in the 50s. So to hear this man speak of soccer in, the, in this area uh, was kind of surprising. But anyhow, soccer is seen as a, an international sport and would be promoted, and uh, the traditional sport of American baseball uh, would be de-emphasized and possibly eliminated. Uh, eliminated because it uh, might be seen as too American. And uh, he discussed how to, uh, eliminating this uh, one's first reaction might be, well, you pay the players poorly and they don't want to play for poor pay. 
so they give up baseball and either go into some other sport or some other activity. But he said that's really not how it works. Uh, actually, uh, the way to break down the uh, baseball would be to uh, make the salaries go very high. And uh, the idea behind this was that uh, as the salaries got ridiculously high, there would be a certain amount of uh, discontent uh, and antagonism as people uh, resented athletes being paid so much and the athletes uh, would begin more and more to resent among themselves uh, what other players were paid and uh, would tend to abandon the sport. And these high salaries then also could break the owners and uh, alienate the fans. And then the fans would support soccer and the baseball fields could be used as soccer fields. Uh, wasn't said definitely this would have to happen, but if the international flavor didn't come around uh, rapidly enough, uh, this could be done. There was some comment uh, along the same lines about football, although uh, I seem to recall he said football would be harder to uh, dismantle uh, because it was so widely uh, in the colleges as well as the professional leagues and would be harder to tear down. And there was something also about the uh, violence in football that met a psychological need that was perceived and uh, people have a need for this vicarious violence and uh, so football for that reason might be left around to meet that vicarious need. Uh, same thing too with hockey. Uh, Hockey uh, had more of an international flavor and would be emphasized. There was some foreseeable international competition uh, about hockey and particularly soccer. At that time, hockey was international between the United States and Canada. Uh, I was kind of surprised because I thought the speaker uh, just never impressed me as uh, being at all a hockey fan, and, <laughs> and I am. But uh, and it turns out he was not. Uh, he just knew about the game and uh, what it would do to this changing sports program. But in any event, soccer was to be the keystone of athletics because it's already a worldwide sport. Uh, it's South America and Europe and parts of Asia and the United States should get on the bandwagon. And all this would foster international competition so that we would all become citizens of the world to a greater extent than citizens of our own narrow nations. There was some discussion about hunting. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, hunting requires guns and gun control is a big uh, element in these plans and uh, I don't remember the details much, but uh, the idea is that gun ownership is a privilege and not everybody should have guns and hunting was an inadequate excuse for owning guns and uh, everybody should be uh, restricted in gun ownership, the few privileged people who should be allowed to hunt could maybe rent or borrow a gun from official quarters rather than own their own. After all, everybody doesn't have a, have a need for a gun was the way it was put. Uh, very important with sports was sports for girls. Uh, athletics would be pushed for girls, and this was intended to replace dolls. Baby dolls would still be around a few of them, but you would not see the uh, uh, number and variety of dolls, and dolls would not be pushed because girls should not be thinking about babies and reproduction. Girls should be out on the athletic field uh, just as the boys are. Girls and boys really need not be all that different. Uh, tea sets were to go the way of dolls, and all these things that... Uh, traditionally were thought of as feminine would be uh, greatly de-emphasized as girls got into uh, more masculine pursuits. And uh, just one of the things I recall was that the sports pages uh, would be full of the scores of girls teams just right there, right along with the boys teams. Uh, and that's uh, recently begun to, after 20 years, recently begun to appear in our local papers. The girls sports scores are right along with the boys sports scores. So all of this to change the role model of what a young girl should look to be uh, while she's growing up, she should look to be an athlete uh, rather than to look forward to being a mother. Uh, entertainment. Movies would gradually be made more explicit as regards sex 
and language. After all, sex and rough language are real, and uh, why pretend that they are not? Uh, there would be pornographic movies uh, in the theaters, on television, and uh, VCRs were not around at that time, but they had indicated that uh, uh, these, these cassettes would be available and video cassette players would be available for use in the home. And pornographic movies would be available uh, on these VCRs as, uh, as well as in the neighborhood theater and uh, on your television. It said something like people, uh, you'll see people in the movies doing everything you can think of. Uh, went on to say that, uh, and all of this is to, to bring sex out in the open. That was another comment that was made several times, a, a term, sex out in the open. Uh, violence would be made more graphic. This was uh, intended to desensitize people to violence. There might need to be a time when people would witness real violence and be a part of it. Uh, later on, it'll become clear where this is headed. Uh, so there would be more realistic violence in entertainment. Uh, would make it easier for people to adjust. Uh, people's attitudes towards death would change, and uh, they would not be so fearful of it, but more accepting of it and not be so aghast at the sight of dead people or injured people. Uh, we don't need to have a genteel population paralyzed by what they might see. Uh, people would just learn to say, uh, well, I don't want that to happen to me. This was the uh, first statement uh, suggesting that the plan includes uh, numerous human casualties uh, which the survivors would see. This particular aspect of the presentation came back in my memory very sharply a few years later when a movie about the Lone Ranger came out and I took my very young son to see it and early in the movie were some very violent scenes. Uh, one of the victims uh, shot in the forehead and there was sort of a splat where the bullet entered his forehead and some blood and I remember regretting that I took my son and remember of feeling anger toward the doctor who spoke, not that he made the movie, but uh, he agreed to be part of this movement and I was repelled by the movie and it brought back this aspect of his presentation very sharply in my memory. As regards music, he made a rather straightforward statement like, music will get worse. And uh, in 1969, the rock music was uh, getting more and more unpleasant. Uh, it was interesting that just his word, the way he expressed it, it would get worse, acknowledging that it was already bad. Uh, lyrics would become uh, more openly sexual. No new sugary romantic music would be publicized like uh, that which had been written uh, before that time. All the old music would be brought back on certain radio stations and records for older people to hear. Uh, and they would, older folks would have sort of their own radio stations to hear. Uh, and the younger people, their music, as it got worse and worse, uh, would be on their stations. And he seemed to indicate that uh, one group would uh, not hear the other group's music. Older folks would just refuse to hear the uh, junk that was offered to young people, and the young people would accept the junk because it was uh, identified them as their generation and uh, helped them feel distinct from the uh, older generation. I remember at the time of thinking that would not last very long because uh, uh, even young kids wouldn't like the junk when they got a chance to hear the older music that was prettier, they would uh, gravitate toward it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, when the kids get through their teens and into their 20s, some of them improve their taste in music. But uh, unfortunately, uh, he was right. They get used to this junk, and that's all they want. Uh, a lot of them can't uh, stand really pretty music. He went on to say the music would carry uh, a message to the young, and uh, nobody would even know the message was there. They just uh, think it was loud music. Uh, at the time, I didn't uh, understand quite what he meant by that, but uh, in retrospect, I think we 
know what the messages are in the music for the young. And uh, again, he was right. This uh, aspect was sort of summarized with a notion that uh, entertainment would be a tool to influence young people. won't change the older people they are already set in their ways. Uh, but the changes would be all aimed at the young who are in their formative years, and the older generation would be passing. Not only could you not change them, but they're relatively unimportant anyhow. Once they live out their lives and are gone, the younger generation being formed are the ones that uh, would be important for the future in the 21st century. He also indicated all the old movies would be brought back again, and uh, I remember on hearing that, uh, through my mind ran quickly the memories of a number of old movies that uh, I, I wondered if they would be included, the uh, ones that I thought I would like to see again. Along with bringing back old music and old movies for uh, older people, there were other privileges that uh, also would be accorded to uh, older folks. Uh, um, free transportation, uh, breaks on uh, purchases, uh, discounts, uh, tax discounts, uh, a number of privileges just because they were older. And uh, this was uh, stated to be sort of a reward for the generation which had uh, grown up through the Depression and uh, had survived the rigors of World War II. They had deserved it and they were going to be rewarded with all these goodies. And the bringing back of the good old music and the good old movies was going to uh, help ease them through their final years in comfort. Uh, then the presentation began to get rather grim because once that generation passed, and that would be in the late 80s and the early 90s where we are now, uh, most of that group would be gone. And then gradually uh, things would tighten up and the tightening up would be accelerated. The old movies and old songs would be withdrawn. The gentler entertainment would be withdrawn. Travel instead of being easy for old folks uh, travel then would become very restricted people would need permission to travel and they would need a good reason to travel if you didn't have a good reason for your travel uh, you would not be allowed to travel and everyone would need id uh, this would at first be an id card you would carry on your person and you must show when you're asked for it uh, it was already planned uh, that later on some sort of device would be uh, developed to be implanted under the skin that would be coded specifically to identify the individual. This would eliminate the possibility of a false ID and also eliminate the possibility of people saying, well, I lost my ID. Uh, the difficulty about the skin implanted ID was stated to be getting a material that would stay in or under the skin without causing a foreign body reaction whereby the body would reject it uh, or cause infection and uh, that this would uh, have to be material uh, on which information could be recorded and retrieved by some sort of scanner while it was not rejected by the body. Silicone uh, was mentioned. Uh, silicone uh, at that time uh, was thought to be well tolerated. It was used to augment breasts. Women who felt their breasts were too small would get silicone implants. Uh, I guess that still goes on. In any event, silicone was seen at that time as the promising material to do both, to be retained in the body without rejection and to be able to retain information retrievable by electronic means. Food. Uh, food supply would come under tight control. Uh, if population growth didn't slow down, food shortages could be created uh, in a hurry and people would realize the dangers of overpopulation. Uh, ultimately, uh, whether the population slows down or not, though, the food supply is to be brought under centralized control so that uh, People would have enough to be well nourished, but they would not have enough to support any fugitive from the new system. In other words, if you had a friend or relative who didn't sign on, uh, and growing one's own food would be outlawed. This would be uh, done under some sort of pretext. In the beginning, I mentioned there were two 
purposes for everything. One, the ostensible purpose, and two, the real purpose. And uh, an ostensible purpose here would be that uh, growing your own vegetables was unsafe, it would spread disease or something like that. So the acceptable idea was uh, to protect the uh, uh, consumer, but the real idea is to limit the food supply and food, growing your own food would be illegal. And if you persist in illegal activities like growing food, then you're a criminal. Uh, there was a mention then of weather, W-A-T-H-E-R. This was another uh, really striking statement. He said, we can or soon will be able to control the weather. He said, I'm not merely referring to dropping iodide crystals into clouds to precipitate rain, rain that's already there, but real control. And uh, weather was uh, seen as uh, a weapon of war, a weapon of uh, influencing public policy. You could make rain or withhold rain in order to uh, influence certain areas uh, and bring them under your control. Uh, one, there were two sides to this that were kind of striking. He said, on the one hand, you can make drought during the growing season. Uh, so that nothing will grow. And on the other hand, you can make for very heavy rains during the harvest seasons so that the fields are too muddy to bring in the harvest. And indeed, one might be able to do both. There was no statement how this would be done. It was stated that it was either already possible or very, very close to being possible. Uh, politics. He said, very few people know how government really works something to the effect that elected officials are influenced in ways that uh, they don't even realize. And they carry out plans that have been made for them and they think they are making, uh, that they are authors of the plans. But uh, actually they've been, uh, are manipulated in ways that they don't understand. Somewhere in the presentation he made two statements that I want to insert at this time. I don't remember just where they were made, but uh, uh, they're valid. Uh, as in terms of the general overall view, the one statement, people can carry in their minds and act upon two contradictory ideas at the same time, provided these uh, two contradictory ideas are kept far enough apart. And the other one, uh, the other statement is, you, know, uh, you can know pretty well how rational people are going to respond to certain circumstances or to certain information that they encounter. So to determine the response you want, you need only control the kind of data or information uh, that they are presented or the kinds of circumstances they're in. And being rational people, they'll do what you want them to do. They may not fully understand what they're doing or why. Somewhere in this connection then uh, was a statement admitting that some scientific research data could be and indeed has been falsified in order to bring about desired results. And uh, here it was uh, said, uh, people don't ask the right questions. Uh, some people are too trusting. Now this was an interesting statement because the speaker and the audience are all being doctors of medicine and supposedly very objectively, dispassionately scientific, and science being the be-all and end-all, well, to falsify data, scientific research data, in that uh, setting is like blasphemy in the church. You just don't do that. Anyhow, out of all of this was to, uh, on the political scene, was to come the new international governing body probably to come through the UN uh, and with the World Court, but uh, not necessarily through those structures. It could be brought about in other ways. Uh, acceptance of the UN at that time was seen as not being as wide as had been hoped. Efforts would continue to give the United Nations uh, increasing importance. Uh, people would be more and more used to the idea of relinquishing some national sovereignty Economic interdependence would foster this goal from a peaceful standpoint. Avoidance of war would foster it uh, from the standpoint of uh, worrying about hostilities. Uh, it was uh, recognized that doing it peaceably was better than doing it by war. 
Uh, it was stated at this point that war is obsolete. And I thought that was an interesting phrase uh, because obsolete means something that once was seen as useful is no longer useful. But war is obsolete, uh, this being because of the uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, war is no longer controllable. Formerly, uh, wars could be controlled. But if nuclear weapons would fall into the wrong hands, uh, there could be an unintended nuclear disaster. Uh, it was not stated who the wrong hands are. We were free to infer that maybe this meant terrorists. But in more recent years, I'm wondering whether the wrong hands might also include uh, people that we've assumed have had nuclear weapons all along. Maybe they don't have them. Just as it was stated that uh, industry would be preserved in the United States a little bit, just in case the worldwide plans didn't work out, just in case uh, some country or some other powerful person decided to bolt from the pack and go his own way, uh, one wonders whether this might also be true with nuclear weapons. When uh, uh, you hear that uh, he said they might fall into the wrong hands, there was some statement that uh, the possession of nuclear weapons uh, has been tightly controlled uh, uh, sort of implying that uh, anybody who had nuclear weapons uh, was intended to have them. That would necessarily have included the Soviet Union, uh, if indeed they have them. Uh, but I recall at the time of wondering, uh, are you telling us or are you implying that, uh, that this country uh, willingly gave nuclear weapons to the Soviets at that time? That seemed like a terribly unthinkable thing to do, much less to admit. The leaders of the Soviet Union seem to be so dependent on the West, though one wonders whether there might have been some fear that they would try to assert independence if they indeed had these weapons. So I don't know. It's something to speculate about, perhaps. Who did he mean when he said if these weapons fall into the wrong hands? Maybe just terrorists. We'll see. Anyhow, the new system would be brought in, uh, if not by uh, peaceful cooperation, everybody willingly yielding national sovereignty, then by bringing the nation to the brink of nuclear war. Uh, and everybody would be so fearful, uh, uh, as hysteria was created about the possibility of nuclear war, that there would be a strong public outcry to negotiate a peace, and people would willingly give up national sovereignty uh, in order to achieve peace, and thereby this would uh, bring in the new international political system. Uh, this uh, was stated, and a uh, very impressive thing to hear then, uh, if there were too many people in the right places who resisted this, there might be a need to use one or two, possibly more nuclear weapons, uh, as it was put, uh, this would be possibly needed to convince people that we mean business. Uh, and that was followed with a statement that uh, by the time one or two of those went off, then everybody, uh, even the most reluctant, would yield. He said something about this negotiated peace would be very convincing. This kind of uh, in a framework or in a context uh, that the whole thing was rehearsed, uh, but nobody would know it. Uh, People hearing about it would be convinced that it was a genuine negotiation between uh, uh, hostile enemies who finally had come to the realization that peace was better than war. Uh, in this context, uh, discussing war and war is obsolete, a statement was made that uh, there were some good things about war. Uh, one, uh, you're going to die anyway, and people sometimes uh, in war. Uh, get a chance to display great courage and heroism and uh, uh, if they die they've died well and if they survive they get recognition so that in any case the hardships of war on the soldiers uh, are worth it because that's the reward they get out of their warring. Another justification for war uh, expressed was uh, 
if you think of the many millions of casualties in uh, World War I and World War II, well, suppose all those people had not died but continued to live and continued to have babies. Uh, there would be millions upon millions, uh, and we would already be overpopulated. So those two great wars served a uh, benign purpose in delaying overpopulation. But now there are technological means uh, for the individual and governments to control overpopulation. So uh, in this regard, war is obsolete. It's no longer needed. And then it's, uh, again, it's obsolete because nuclear weapons uh, could destroy the whole universe. Uh, war, once w war, which once was controllable, uh, could get out of control. And so for these two reasons, it's now obsolete. There was a discussion of terrorism. Uh, terrorism would be uh, used widely in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, terrorism that at that time was felt would uh, not be necessary in the United States. It possibly could become necessary if the United States uh, did not move uh, rapidly enough into accepting the system. Um, but at least in the foreseeable future, it was not planned and uh, very benignly <laughs> on their part. You know, maybe terrorism would not be required here but the implication being that it would be indeed used if uh, if it was necessary. Along with this came a little bit of a scolding that Americans have had it uh, too good anyway, and uh, just a little bit of terrorism would help convince Americans that the world uh, indeed is a dangerous place, or it can be if we don't uh, relinquish control of the proper authorities. There was discussion of money and banking. Uh, one statement was, uh, Inflation is uh, infinite. You can put an infinite number of zeros after any number and put the decimal points wherever you want. Uh, this is an indication that inflation is a tool of controllers. Uh, money was would become predominantly credit. It was already already money is primarily a credit thing, but. Uh, uh, exchange of uh, money would be. Uh, not cash or, or palpable things, but uh, electronic credit signals. Uh, people would carry money only in very small amounts for things like chewing gum and candy bars, just pocket sorts of things. Any purchase of uh, any significant amount would be done electronically. Uh, Earnings uh, would be electronically entered into your account. It, or there would be a single banking system. It may have the appearance of being more than one, but ultimately, it basically, it would be one single banking system. So that uh, when you got paid, your pay would be entered for you into your account balance. And then when you purchased anything uh, at the point of purchase, it would be deducted, be deducted from your account balance, and you would actually carry nothing with you. Also, uh, computer records can be kept of whatever it was you purchased, so that if you were purchasing too much of uh, any particular item, uh, somebody, you know, some official wanted to know what you were doing with your money, they could uh, go back and review your purchases and determine uh, what it was you were buying. There was a statement uh, to the effect that any uh, purchase of significant size, like an automobile, a bicycle, a refrigerator, a radio, or television, or whatever, uh, might be uh, have some sort of identification on it where it could be traced so that very quickly anything which was either given away or stolen, uh, whatever, uh, authorities would be able to establish who purchased it and when. Computers would allow this to happen. The ability to save would be greatly curtailed. Uh, people would just not be able to save uh, any considerable degree of wealth. Uh, there was some statement of the recognition that wealth represents power and uh, wealth in the hands of uh, a lot of uh, people uh, is not good for the uh, people in charge. So that uh, if you save too much, uh, you might be taxed.
Uh, the more you save, the higher the rate of tax on your savings, so your savings really could never get very far. And also, if you begin to show a pattern of saving too much, uh, you might have your pay cut. People would say, well, you're saving instead of spending. You really don't need all that money. But uh, basically, the idea being to prevent people from accumulating any uh, wealth which might have long-range uh, disruptive influence on the system. People would be encouraged to uh, use credit uh, to borrow uh, and then also be encouraged to uh, uh, also be encouraged to renege on their debt so that they would uh, destroy their own credit. And the idea here is that, uh, again, if you're too stupid to handle credit wisely, uh, this gives the authorities the chance to uh, come down hard on you once you've overshot your credit. Electronic payments initially would all be based on uh, different kinds of uh, credit cards. These were already uh, in use in 1969 to uh, some extent, not as much as now. But uh, people would have uh, credit cards with the electronic strip on it. And once they got used to that, then it would be pointed out the advantage of having all of this combined into a single credit card serving a single monetary system. Uh, and then you don't have to carry around all that plastic. So the next step would be the single card. And then the next step would be to replace the single card with a skin implant. Uh, the single card could uh, be lost or stolen give rise to problems, uh, could be exchanged with somebody else to confuse identity. Uh, the skin implant, on the other hand, uh, would be uh, not losable or counterfeitable or transferable to another person. So you and your accounts would be identified without uh, any possibility of error. And the skin implant, of course, would have to be put somewhere that was convenient to the scanner for example, your right hand or your forehead. At that time when I heard this, I was unfamiliar with the statements in the book of Revelation. Uh, the speaker went on to say, now some of you people who read the Bible uh, will attach significance to this, uh, to the Bible. But he went on to uh, disclaim any biblical significance at all. This is just common sense of how the system uh, could work and should work and uh, there's no need to read any superstitious biblical principles into it. As I say at the time, I was not uh, very familiar with the uh, words of Revelation. Uh, shortly after that, I became familiar with them, and the uh, significance of what he said really was striking. I'll never forget it. There was some mention also of implants uh, that would lend themselves to surveillance by providing radio signals. Uh, this could be under the skin or a dental implant uh, put in like a filling uh, so that uh, either fugitives or uh, possibly every citizen could be identified by a certain frequency from his uh, personal transmitter and could be located at any time or in any place by any authority who wanted to find him. This would be particularly useful if somebody uh, broke out of prison. There was more discussion of uh, personal surveillance. Uh, one thing was said, uh, you'll be watching television and somebody will be watching you at the same time at a central monitoring station. Uh, television sets would have a device to enable this. The TV set would not have to be on in order for this to be operative. Uh, also, the television set can be used to monitor what you are watching. People uh, can tell what you're watching on the TV and how you're reacting to what you're watching. Uh, and uh, you would not know that you were being watched while you were watching your television. Uh, how would we get people to accept these things into their homes? Well, people would buy them when they buy their own television. They won't know that they're on there at first. Uh, this was uh, described as being by uh, what we now know as cable TV to replace antenna TV. When you buy a TV set, this monitor would uh, just be a part of the set, and most people uh, would not have enough knowledge of electronics to know it's there in the beginning. And then the, uh, the cable would be the means of carrying the surveillance uh, message to the monitor. 
by the time uh, people found out uh, that this monitoring was going on, they would also be already very dependent upon television for a number of things. Uh, just the way people are dependent on the telephone today, one thing the television would be used for would be purchases. You wouldn't have to leave your home to purchase. You just turn on your TV and there would be a way of interacting with the television uh, channel to the store that you wanted to purchase. And you could flip the switch from uh, place to place to choose a refrigerator or clothing. Uh, this would be both convenient, but it all also would make you dependent on the television so that the built-in monitor is something you could not uh, do without. There was some discussion of audio monitors too, uh, just in case uh, the authorities wanted to hear what was going on in, in rooms other than where the television monitor was. And uh, in regard to this uh, statement was made, any wire going into your house, for example, your, television, your telephone wire could be used this way. I remember this in particular because it was fairly near the end of the presentation and as we were leaving the uh, meeting place I said something to one of my colleagues about going home and pulling all the wires out of the house except that I knew I couldn't get by without the telephone and uh, the colleague I spoke to just seemed numb. He, uh, to this day I don't think he even remembers what we talked about or, or what we heard that time because I've asked him. But at that time he seemed uh, stunned. Before all these changes would take place uh, with electronic monitoring, it was mentioned that there would be service trucks all over the place uh, working on the wires and putting in new cables. Uh, this is how people uh, who were on the inside would know how things were progressing. Privately owned housing would become a thing of the past. Uh, the cost of housing uh, and financing housing would gradually be made so high that uh, most people can afford it. People who already owned their houses would be allowed to keep them, but as years go by, it would be more and more difficult for young people to buy a house. Young people would more and more become renters, particularly in apartments or condominiums. More and more uh, unsold houses would stand vacant. Uh, people just couldn't buy them. Uh, but the cost of housing would not come down. You'd right away think, well, the vacant house, the price will come down, people will buy it. But there was some statement that, uh, to the effect that the price would be held high, even though there was uh, many of them available, so that free marketplaces would not operate. People would not be able to buy these, and gradually more and more the population would be forced into small apartments, small apartments which would not accommodate very many children. Then as the number of real homeowners uh, diminished, uh, they would become a minority. There would be no sympathy for them from the majority who dwelled in apartments, and uh, then these homes could be taken by uh, increased taxes or other regulations that would be detrimental to home ownership and would be acceptable to the majority. Ultimately, people would be assigned where they would live and it would be common to have non-family members living with you. This by way of your not knowing just how far you could trust anybody. Um, this would all be under the control of a central housing authority. Have this in mind in 1990 when the census comes out and they ask how many bedrooms in your house, how many bathrooms in your house, do you have a finished game room? This information really is personal and of no uh, national interest to uh, government under our existing constitution, but you'll be asked those questions and uh, decide how you want to respond to them. When the new system takes over, uh, people will be expected to sign uh, allegiance to it, indicating they don't have any reservations or holding back to the old system. There just won't be any room he said, for people who won't go along. We can't have such people cluttering up the place, so such people would be taken to special places. And here I don't remember the exact words, but the uh, inference I drew was that at these special places where they were taken, uh, then they would uh, not live very long. He may have said something like disposed of humanely, but I don't remember very precisely uh, just the impression that uh, the uh, system was not going to support them when they would not go along with the system. That would leave death as the only alternative. 
somewhere in this vein, he said uh, there would not be any martyrs. Uh, when I first heard that, I thought he meant that people would not be killed, but uh, as the presentation developed, uh, what he meant was uh, they would not be killed in such a way or disposed of in such a way that they could serve as inspiration to other people the way martyrs do. Uh, rather, he said something like this, uh, people will just disappear. Just a few additional items sort of uh, thrown in here at the end, which I failed to include uh, where they belong more appropriately. One, uh, the bringing in of the new system, he said, probably would occur on a weekend in the winter. Everything would shut down on Friday evening and uh, Monday morning when everybody wakened, there would be an announcement made that the uh, new system was in place. During the process of getting the United States ready for these changes, um, he commented everybody would be busier with less leisure time and less opportunity for people to really look about and see what was going on around them. Also, there would be more changes, uh, more difficult to keep up as far as one's investments. Investment instruments would be changing policies, interest rates changing so that it would be a difficult job just to keep up with what you had already earned. Interesting about automobiles, there would it would look as though there were many, many varieties of automobiles, but when you looked very closely, uh, there would be great duplication. It would be made to look different with chrome and uh, wheel covers and this sort of thing, but looking closely, uh, one would see that the uh, same automobile was made by more than one manufacturer. This recently was brought home to me when I was in a parking lot and saw a small Ford, I forget the model, and a small Japanese automobile, which were identical, except for little things like the number of holes in the wheel cover and the chrome around the plate and the shape of the grill. But if you looked at the basic parts of the automobiles, they were identical. They just happened to be parked side by side uh, where I was struck with this, and uh, I was again reminded of what had been said many years ago. I'm hurrying here because I'm near the end of the tape, and let me just summarize by saying to hear all of these things said by one individual at one time in one place uh, relating to so many different uh, human endeavors, and then to look and see how many of these actually came about, that is, changes accomplished between then and now, and the things which are planned uh, for the future. I think there's uh, no denying that uh, this is controlled and there is indeed a conspiracy. The question then becomes what to do, and I think uh, first off we must put our faith in God and pray and ask for his guidance, and secondly I think do what we can to inform other individuals uh, as much as possible, as much as they may be interested. Some people just don't care because they're preoccupied with uh, uh, getting along in their own personal endeavors. But as much as possible, I think we should try to inform other people who may be interested and, again, put our faith and trust in God and pray constantly for his guidance and for the courage to accept what we may be facing in the near future. Rather than accept peace and justice, which we hear so much now, it's a cliche, uh, let's insist on liberty and justice for all.